Hi everybody, it's time to start working on moving our player around. If you want to follow along, you just check out the code from part two, and that way you'll start where we're starting right now. There's two things that we have to think about when we're dealing with player movement. One, we have to know, we have to keep track of which direction the player is moving in. And then two, we have to think about the speed at which we want to move. Let's start with the update and render section of our game loop. And this is where we will check the direction that the player is moving in. And we'll do something like this. If game left, and we'll go for right, up, and down. Right, up, and down. These flags will be set based on the keyboard events that we have coming in. And we set it on the game struct just so that we can reference that throughout our code. So how do we set these? Get keyboard state will return an array of bytes. And if a key is activated, if it's pressed, then it will be a one. If it's not, it'll be a zero. So that's how we can set these values. Every time our game loop uh, starts, we uh, grab the current state and then we act accordingly. So I've already written this out. I don't want to bore you with typing everything, everything out in front of you. So here's our game states. Uh, and of course, to set these, we'll have to add the fields to our game struct. So we have left, it'll be a Boolean. Let's see, right, and down. How are these set? We check the array, so here's the state array, and we check to see if scan code A, which is the A key, see if it's pressed. If it's greater than zero, that means it's pressed. If it's not, then it's not pressed. So that will trigger, that will set the Boolean flag right here on left, right, up, and down. We could do this on a key down and a key up event. Uh, you can look at the guide for more details. Basically, the key down event will set the key to true active and the key up event will set it to false again and it's a lot more it's a lot more code to write so it's easier with movement anyway to use the keyboard state like I am right here so if we have uh, let's say if we're moving left we want to do something like move player and we want to move a certain x and a certain y distance now since we're going left the y change will be zero so we're passing in the change in position that we want to make to the player destination struct. Remember the destination struct on the entity is the SDL rect and it keeps track of the position of our sprite on the screen. So what's the change in X? If we're moving left, the change will be negative. So X has to be negative. We'll call this delta motion. This is the amount that we want to move. Delta motion and we'll just set that to one right now and I do want to make it an F64. Uh, for reasons that I'll explain later on, but this will help us uh, when we're doing some math on our positioning. It'll be a little more accurate. So delta motion is negative if we're going to the left, but it's positive if we're going to the right. The X and Y on a window, the top left is 0, 0. If we're moving up, delta motion will be on the Y axis. Uh, let's see. And we're moving up, so it will be negative, heading towards zero. If we're going down, it will be a positive Y movement. Now, the reason I have a separate if check for all of them, rather than an if, else if, else if, is because I want to account for moving on a diagonal. And right now, moving on a diagonal, it's going to be a little faster. Uh, you may have played games where if you, if you move on an angle, you can move faster and outrun enemies. That's not what we want, but we'll deal with that later on. For now, we'll just uh, we'll keep it simple. Now, move player. You can find it in the guide. Again, I'm just going to copy and paste to save you some, save you from watching me. Move player is a procedure. It takes an X and a Y, as you just saw above. Now, with Odin, I want to point out that because X and Y are the same type, you can just string them together with a comma and only set the type at the end. So it's, it saves you from a lot of typing, actually. It's a little bit easier to read, too, I think. So both of them are a float 64. That's why I'm able to use the comma there and then use the colon to indicate which type they are. The function that we're using uh, is clamp. And we're doing this because we want to keep our player within the window. What clamp will do takes three arguments. The first argument is your, your desired number, OK? Uh, so the number you want. And it will check it against the next argument, which is a minimum. 
and the next uh, argument after that, which is a maximum. If the number you want is lower than the minimum, then clamp will return the minimum. If it's higher than the maximum, then clamp will return the maximum. So this is a handy way to keep your player within the window boundaries. And of course, with X and Y, we check a slightly different boundary. Both check against a minimum of zero, uh, but we account for the sprite width and the height when we're checking against the edges, the right edge and the bottom edge. Move player will set the X and Y coordinate on the destination struct right here directly in the function. We don't return anything, so we don't have to worry about that right now. I like to use a separate function like move player because in the future we're going to be doing some collision detection, so that makes it a little bit easier going uh, down the road. So we reset the position based on the delta motion, and then we render copy, and then our player is rendered on the screen again with its new destination. So let's recompile. And you can see that we're now able to move around by holding the W, A, S, or D keys. We go up, we go down, we go left or right. And it's going very slowly, but we'll make sure it's not going off screen. Yeah, it stops. So you can test that out yourself. Now it is moving slowly though. I'd rather move a little bit more quickly. Uh, to do this, we can do something like player speed. I like to set these up in co as constants just so I can um, easily tweak the numbers uh, if I want to play around with different things. So player speed, I set it also to a float. And the 400, that sounds like it'll be very, very fast, and it will be. But I want to account for different frame rates. Right now, we are enforcing a frame rate of 60 frames per second. But in the future, if we want to accommodate those with slower computers, then we may want to run at 30 frames a second. If we do that, then the, the speed of the character will be different, of course, on the different hardware. We don't want to be tied to the frame rate. We want to adapt to different frame rates. So how do we do that? We multiply our desired speed, which would be the desired number of pixels moved per second, and we multiply that by our frame rate. So our frame rate is um, target DT. We have that above here. Target DT is 1000 over 60, which is 60 frames per second. That's in milliseconds, though. That's giving us 1617. So we have to divide it by uh, 1000 again to get the milliseconds. And once we do that, we'll end up with a fractional value that uh, will tell us the incremental amount we want to move every frame so that if we were to hold that button down, after a full second, it will travel our desired speed, which is 400 pixels per second. So let's run that again. This time we're moving at a much better clip. And of course, you can play around with different speeds just to see what you like. Uh, maybe we want to do 1,000, which will go really fast. So you can see it's much faster now. And you'll notice that we do move faster on the, ag on the diagonal, but we'll deal with that another time. Now, wrapping your head around something like delta time, delta motion, uh, I found it challenging. So I've done other videos where I share some of the little programs, uh, a little program that I wrote to help me visualize the different approaches that people take to handling delta motion, delta speed. And they come down to a combination of uh, enforcing frame rates or calculating the time it took for a previous frame to finish and using that as the delta, the target uh, delta right there. Or rather, it would just be called delta time because they're checking what the previous frame took, not necessarily the same as what the current frame will take. So it has its problems. Um, I've decided to target a certain delta time. That's why we use the spin lock here at the bottom. And I just find that easier, especially now that uh, we're just kind of doing some simple stuff. So again, I'll share a link to that other video and the little program that I wrote so you can check it out and uh, dive a little bit deeper. Try not to get too much lost into the weeds though, and let's we'll keep moving with our project here um, just to keep growing and learning. It is, uh, it's a lot to take in. There's a lot there, but anyway, hopefully it'll help you. Thanks for watching this video, and if you liked it, please let me know. If you have troubles, let me know. Uh, if you have any other info to share, I'd like to hear that too. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.